Hi, John Clay, VP of Threat Intelligence at Trend Micro, and welcome again to episode 13 of Trend Talks BizSec. Uh, joining me again is Ed Cabrera, Chief Cybersecurity Officer at Trend. Ed, how are you today? Doing fantastic. It is the holiday season after all. Yeah, I'm loving this time of year, and it also means it's prediction time. So let's talk about 2023. I think today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the threat uh, landscape changes we're going to see in 23, and then maybe some defense strategies that organizations can take advantage of or we might see in 23. You know, the first one, Ed, I think, is let's talk about ransomware. Ransomware has been the, the big topic of, of the year, and uh, our prediction at Trend Micro, we just published this week, our predictions for 23 was that ransomware actors are going to shift a little bit because uh, because the encryption process may be being detected more often than not by the current security controls, so they may have to shift. What, what are your thoughts around this? No, I really do believe, and I just want to add a little bit of twist on what we we're predicting about that shift. I think arguably... Um, the one thing that won't shift is, is the idea of digital extortion. Um, right. We live in a reputation economy um, globally between us uh, as individuals, as, as organizations. And so the risk to uh, individual and corporate uh, reputations is very big now, right? And, 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 and the digital extortion aspect to it, the, the monetization side of the house, I think is a, the engine that's not going to go away. But I ab uh, definitely agree with our predictions where we think that it's going to be the shift when it comes to uh, possibly moving away from the encryption piece. Yeah, and, you know, I think part of that, Ed, if you look at detection rates, among, uh, even in our, our own data, of the actual ransomware malware, we're detecting that very easily, to be honest. Um, what usually trips up a customer is when they get access to an account that can turn off the security agent. Then you obviously have no defense against a piece of malware dropping on that system. So, you know, between behavior monitoring, between a, ma a machine learning or AI scan engine, we're detecting the ransomware. We're detecting the new versions of it, the variants of it. And so we can stop that. But I think the, the biggest thing, the biggest shift that we're probably going to see in 23 is this idea, let's shift left in the attack life cycle, right? So there's a, the, almost all of these attack go through a life cycle, right? There's initial access, and then there's lateral movement, and then there's data exfil. And then ultimately, they get to a point where they're like, we've monetized everything we can inside this company. Let's drop ransomware for the final piece. That ransomware component is being detected now pretty easily, like I said. But, um, but yeah, so how are we going to shift a little bit more left, do you think? I think, you know, it's pretty evident as the, the power and the impact of artificial intelligence. When we start looking at as, uh, as protectors of network systems and, datas, uh, and data, um, I, I think leveraging machine learning for quite some time. I mean, uh, for us at Trend Micro, we've been leveraging machine learning since 2004. Um, yeah. But obviously with uh, chat GPT giving us that extra taste of what is the art of possible, I think, I think we'll have a, a lot of good opportunities to be able to move left of boom, so to speak, to be able to get much more proactive on the prevention and protection aspect uh, and even blocking it before it even becomes an issue. So I, I think there's huge opportunities here when it comes to artif artificial intelligence. How do we uh, sort of, uh, I guess, meet the actual challenge that we're gonna be facing? Because let's be honest, Chat GPT is also going to be incredibly important, and you know when it comes to uh, threat actors, they're going to be leveraging Chat GPT uh, quite extensively. You could see it already to the extent how powerful it is to create communications um, uh, fairly easy. Uh, and so you look at social engineering attacks, uh, uh, business email compromise attacks all of which are heavily focused on the social engineering aspect to it and how quickly you can utilize and leverage an AI platform uh, to be able to get that done. Yeah, you mentioned that we've been using it since 2004. And, uh, you know, we just recently had a, another round of an AI contest inside Trend Micro. We're over a thousand um, 
uh, people participated. And what they had to do is, is create a AI ML um, program to run a robot through a course, and it had to deal with unknowns. And I liken that because we're, we're teaching our our employees how to utilize AI and how to use AI, but then also how to deal with unknowns. And that's the big problem in, in cybersecurity. It's usually the unknown threat that comes in, whether it's a zero day or whether it's a new variant of a, of a ransomware or some type of threat. And it's unknown to the security vendors, and, and which means it's unknown to the customer, which means now they're going to get infected. But if we can start moving that needle to where we're detecting all of these unknowns, that's, the, that's where we want. That's a panacea, so to speak, right, for, for um, cybersecurity. Yeah, I mean, you think about it. Let's use analogy. It's the human body, and the way the human body uh, is able to detect um, uh, bacteria, viruses, and what ends up happening in your body is your immune system kicks in and you it gets flush with uh, white blood cells to combat that infection or, 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 or virus. So you can imagine we've been talking about this holy grail in security as this self-healing network concept where we, you can actually be able to then detect uh, and remediate uh, you know, fairly quickly in an automated fashion. And so this is, uh, this is where definitely where we can get to the left of, of boom, so to speak, when we're talking about how can we better protect, you know, our, our customers and so forth. Yeah, and you know, I think that one of the things you you mentioned there about the the self healing network or the the body self healing. One thing that you know about inside the human body is that when something an infection or something comes around, all of the systems start um, coordinating together and collaborating together. And that's the big challenge that a lot of companies have today is that they've bought all these disparate point products out there none of them talk to each other and that's probably the big thing that shift we're going to see in 23 ed that i think you're going to see a consolidation and um and a way that organizations are going to look at simplifying their cybersecurity. and the way you're going to simplify it is by getting a whether it's a platform or some other approach but you have to get to where all these different components are talking together communicating together, collaborating together. And it's kind of like this idea of a um, database out there that has all of the known threats that you can you can connect to and then you understand and you can pull that data into your network and then you can deal with this stuff. But again, I think the big part is that the challenge is, is identifying the unknowns, right? So how do, you, how do you do anomaly detection? How do you do that? And one of the things that um, you, you and I talked about is simulation, attack simulations. Uh, mm -hmm. Attack simulations can can help an organization understand where their gaps are, where their holes are. Um, any thoughts around this type of technology? Yeah, no. Attack simulations are, are really sort of the next step for a, um, a lot of um, you know vendors in, in in security because of the fact that it's essentially what you're looking at when when you when you hear the word you know the attack simulations is you're automating your pen testing right and, and yeah. to the extent really map to real world incidents and attacks, right? When you're able to then emulate a real world attack in, in an automated fashion, then you can quickly identify what you need to remediate and then remediate um, those risks. And so I, I think getting back to a little bit what you were saying, you know, the first step and how do we get to there is, is I think when you, get, when you talk about attack surface risk management, right? It's first of all, you need to, to be able to heal your network or to automate um, that process. You have to have a, a complete understanding what is on your network, what data, what assets are connected to your network. And, and so having that uh, automated attack uh, surface risk management capability is that, that first step. I mean, you're really automating because you're reducing the complexity, you're reducing the uncertainty, right? Because now you're actually automating this, this, uh, this process of remediation because, you know, you made a good point earlier too. It's, it's not only, you know, from the analogy perspective that you're sending these white blood cells to attack the threat, but you can now, because of attack surface risk management, be able to automate your um, 
your back end protection. In other words, now you're quarantining, which is not so much that's not new, but quarantining assets, reducing the attack surface in an automated fashion to critical systems, databases, and networks. You know, if, if in other words, there is an attack, you know, noticed on a certain asset, uh, at the same time of actually mitigating uh, that threat, you're actually then reducing your attack surface in such an automated fashion where now um, that asset is no longer discoverable, right? In other right. words, now we're able to hide it. And so all of this ties into, and the only way you get to it is sort of emulating it through attack surface um, uh, simulations, excuse me, attack simulation. Uh, right. capabilities and and that was a great announcement that we just had here recently that we're working with simulate and uh, on, and we have other integrations with our vision one pro platform as well to include attack iq and picus so all, all of this stuff is very important to when we think of how do we how are we how we how can we actually get to that level to be able to then integrate with uh, a lot of third-party products and solutions to be able to do better automation, right? I mean, and that's critical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the first step is uh, uh, with us shifting to being becoming a platform vendor that we are going to uh, uh, widely adopt third-party integrations. And we're seeing that with those announcements. But, and I wanna shift just a little bit before we finish up here. You're obviously former CISO of the United States Secret Service. Uh, let's talk a little bit about nation states. Obviously we've got the, the uh, Ukraine Russia incident. You've got China, ta you know, rumblings about Taiwan. But where do you think uh, nation state actors and the attacks are going to be looking like in 23? I, I think there's obviously going to be going to be the extension of as as conflict, physical conflict continues between Russia and Ukraine. Right, the war in Ukraine will actually still create opportunities um, and as we read here recently as there's been some reporting the US government has been able to uh, lend a lot of support uh, in Ukraine so the hunt forward campaign from cyber command and and some of those successes which they couldn't obviously delineate um, specifically but that level of you know cooperation and support uh to ukraine is is, is pretty much evident uh, i would say considering that we haven't seen as much cyber activity as we had predicted coming from this right. conflict but i think that's going to continue i think the discussion between our uh excuse me china and taiwan and, and the friction and the risk associated with um china possibly uh having some level of um, engagement, attack, or, you know. Well, we certainly are. saw DDoS attacks against the Taiwan government um, fairly recently as part of that. Uh, you're going to definitely see that. I just, I, it's curious to me to, to see some of these nation states that are more uh, uh, aggressive offensively, uh, whether the, def the countries that are defending themselves are going to pivot to more of a proactive offensive uh, structure, right? And we're, we saw a little bit of that with, you just mentioned, with uh, U.S. supporting uh, Ukraine a little bit more in their efforts against uh, Russia. And I'm wondering if that's going to spread to other countries, maybe NATO countries lending hands into targeting some of these regimes that tend that have tended over the years to be more aggressive against the uh, the other nation states, whether it's monetarily like like, you know, North Korea doing a lot of crypto theft out there in the world to um, Iran doing a, other types of attacks to, you know, obviously Russia doing destructive attacks against uh, Ukraine. So uh, thoughts around that to finish yeah, up? No, I, I, absolutely. I think those threat actors will continue. Uh, China, Iran, uh, R Russia, North Korea, they will continue their activities. I think what we'll definitely see in 2023 is a greater emphasis on collaboration and partnership, where you will see the output from that collaboration and partnership is exactly what you said. The best defense is a good offense, is taking down uh, infrastructure that is already known to being utilized and leveraged. And we see, you know, every other day now, we'll see a notification of some infrastructure being taken yeah. down. Arguably, that could be seen as a whack-a-mole, you know, strategy. But if you do it in a very strategic manner, in collaboration and partnership with other 
uh, Western uh, allies and so forth. Now, now you're looking at this, this, this uh, you know, to defeat a network, you got to be a network approach. And so I think we'll see a lot of that. Yeah, and just recently, uh, Interpol announced their African surge operation that Trend Micro supported, and we were able to bring down a, a significant amount of infrastructure in Africa and, and actually arrest a whole number of uh, cyber criminals that were perpetrating crime on the Internet. So, you know, those kind of pri- public-private partnerships will going to continue in 23, and like you said, hopefully we see more of those activities, and, and, uh, and, and it helps uh, the, improve the Internet as a whole. No, I, absolutely. I think that that type of partnership, I think, will actually then grow instead of a very ad hoc, uh, non-formal partnerships. I think you will see greater companies and organizations reaching out and saying that they want to do their part. And I think we've been doing our part for 30 years, and I think yeah. we're always welcome to, um, you know, expanding and amplifying our, you know, the research that we do from with over 450 threat and vulnerability researchers across the globe. So for us, I think it's, it's one of those things that uh, it's one of those um, seminal moments that you have to come together and be able to do your part. Yeah. Well, listen, thanks everybody for uh, watching this episode, episode 13 of Trend Talks BizSec. Ed, thanks for joining me again. Thank you. Thank you. It's fantastic and uh, great holiday season. To everyone. Yeah, everybody, I uh, wish you all a happy holiday season and a safe and, and healthy. So until next time, uh, we're going to sign off and have a great week and, and a great uh, holiday. Take care. Bye-bye.